Around 12 months ago, I received notice that a paper I had submitted to Glossa, a linguistics journal, had been rejected. And while rejection is nothing unusual, indeed, it's a common experience of academic publishing, some of the comments of one of the reviewers were particularly provocative, stating that my analysis of Gorwa amounted to exoticization of the language. Because the paper was rejected, I've had no formal channel by which to respond to these comments, which I take seriously and consider objectionable. Because all of these comments have to do with how I represent the Gorwa language through glosses, responding to them also provides a good opportunity to reflect on the choices I've made in describing the language, as well as to share some of my understanding of the Gorwa language with you today. As such, during the course of today's talk, I'd like to introduce the Gorwa language, as well as make a comment on the data used during this talk. I then go into some detail on the rejection which ultimately provoked this talk as a way of framing what is to come. Following this, I engage in some of the specific comments of the anonymous review, all of which are rooted in the question, why do I gloss Gorwa like that? The following section serves as a summary as well as a reflection on why I do linguistics, and the final section lays out next steps. To start then, I think it's important that before we engage with the language from a formal perspective, we first take a moment to look at its position within the larger community in which it is used. We'll start with a brief note about the relationships, both genetic and aerial, which obtain between Gorwa and other languages. Following this, I'll talk about language use, uh, language attitudes, and finally, I will make a brief mention of my involvement with the language. But first, for an idea of what Gorwa looks and sounds like, let's listen to a short recording of Gorwa in which Bejero Quetzo talks with Pascal Bu'u and Bu'u Sahuare about the prophet Saigilo Magena. <laughs> From a genetic perspective, Gorwa is a member of the West Rift branch of Southern Cushitic, and in a genetic tree adapted from Kiesling and Mouse 2003, it can be represented like this. Southern Cushitic itself is part of the larger Cushitic family, which itself is a member of the larger Afroasiatic language phylum, of which languages such as Hausa, Ancient Egyptian, the Amazic varieties, Somali, Arabic, and Hebrew are also members. From a geographic perspective, we can see that the southern Cushitic languages represent the southernmost extent of Afroasiatic. Though not represented on this map, that is, we can't see any yellow within the red circle within which Gorwa is spoken, southern Cushitic is spoken in the center of an area of high linguistic diversity, sometimes referred to as the East African Fragmentation Zone. On this map, adapted from a landmark work by Kiesling, Mouse, and Nurse in 2008 on the Tanzanian Rift Valley, we can immediately see that Gorwa exists at the geographical center of a highly diverse area, where not only 
are other Southern Cushitic languages spoken, but languages from entirely different language phyla, including Nilo-Saharan, Niger-Congo, as well as Sandawe, which uh, is possibly Northern Khoisan, as well as the language isolate Hadza. In terms of language use and attitudes, I'd first say that this topic deserves considerably more attention, but suffice it to say that Gorwa has around 133,000 speakers, and its usage is certainly declining as its speakers switch to using the national lingua franca Swahili. In my experience, language attitudes are characterized by a divide in both age and whether speakers live in urban areas or in more rural locations, with the language seen as more relevant and valuable among the old and those living in rural areas. In terms of my situation in relation to the Gorwa language, I've been working with speakers of the language since 2012. In a wider context, I'm interested in the languages of the Tanzanian Rift Valley, of which Gorwa is a part, their documentation and description, their morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speakers' communities, especially as evinced through language contact and linguistic arts. Before we get into further details, I'd like to briefly do three things. The first is to lay out how to interpret the examples used in this talk. The second is to explain how to go about accessing those examples if you are interested in so doing. And the third is a note on how to access this talk in the future. So first, most examples given in this talk are presented with a four-line gloss. The first line represents a transcription of the utterance as produced, and the orthography I used for Gorwa is phonetic, so this representation can uh, said to come reasonably close to how the utterance sounds. It should be noted that the forward slash in Gorwa is how we represent the voiced pharyngeal fricative, so this string would read garma ina akut. Gora makes extensive use of suprasegmental operations, and this means that sometimes the relationship between the surface realization of the phrase, that is, on the first line, and the constituent meaning of the phrase, on the third line, is hard to determine. So as such, I usually give a second line in which the underlying morphological representation is provided, as highlighted here. The third line is then a morpheme-by-morpheme -morpheme gloss of the form's provided in line two above. The final line is a free translation. In terms of accessing each of the examples provided in this talk, most are provided along with a unique identifier to the right of the first line of the example. These unique identifiers are made up of two parts, an alphanumeric code to the left of a full stop and a number to the right of a full stop. The alphanumeric code refers to the file name in which the recording can be found, and so any interested listener can navigate to the Gorwa archive deposit, which you can do via the QR link on screen, and enter that file name into the search bar highlighted here. This will return all of the files and folders associated with that file name, including the recording itself, as well as XML files created with the ALON software which can be used to see transcriptions and translations of the audiovisual material. The number to the right of the full stop refers to the utterance number within the audiovisual file in which the utterance occurred. So once the ALON file has been downloaded, one can navigate to that utterance number in the ALON file and listen to the utterance as well as check within its larger context. The specific example is highlighted here. To access this talk itself, it will be archived with the following DOI and will also be available on my YouTube account, which can be accessed by following the QR code on screen. This next subsection of the talk is an attempt to frame the rest of today's presentation. Why am I taking the time to go into so much detail about how I gloss Gorwa? As mentioned above, this talk comes from within the larger context of a paper which was rejected from an academic journal and was ultimately provoked by the comments of an anonymous reviewer made during the course of this rejection. As such, I'll start by providing some detail on how these reviewer comments came to be made. I'll then explain why these comments matter to me. And finally, I'll make explicit why I'm talking about these comments.
I'd like to start by laying out how the paper was rejected. And because some members of the audience here today might not have gone through the peer review process before, I'd like to talk a little bit about that as well. So in its most straightforward iteration, the process of having an academic article published looks something like this. An author submits his or her manuscript to an academic journal. The editor assesses the manuscript and sends it to appropriate reviewers. The reviewers conduct detailed reviews, which the editor then assesses. And if assessed favorably, the manuscript is accepted by the journal and published as a journal article. Um, obviously, this is rarely the course of events. So based on reviewer comments, the editor may require, and often does require, that the author make changes to their submitted manuscript and resubmit for further review. All the while, an editor reserves the right to reject a manuscript, either based on the feedback of the reviewers or just out of hand. In the case of my manuscript, upon review, Reviewer 1 provided feedback with the ultimate assessment for me to revise the article and resubmit. This was echoed in the second reviewer's assessment, which was also to revise and resubmit. But in the end, however, it was the editor of Gloss's assessment that my manuscript was not really a good fit for the journal after all and should be rejected. So this was the route to my particular rejection, but this talk is really sort of less concerned with the particular rejection, again, a pretty common experience when one sets about to publish an article, and it's more concerned with the comments of the first anonymous reviewer. Specifically, reviewer one commented that the author, that's me, has a tendency to render Gorwa overly exotic. This exoticization is reflected in the presentation of examples, their segmentation, and their glossing. This is not just a passing comment, but actually forms the basis of a set of comments in the review, which I've listed here below. It's essentially these comments which will guide our examination of Gorwa morphosyntax today. First, however, I should make mention of why I didn't just ignore these comments. After all, they were made anonymously, were directed solely to me and presumably shared with no one else except the editor and myself, and could just as easily have been cast aside and forgotten about. Except I couldn't cast them aside, and I couldn't forget about them. I should say that much of my linguistics is grounded in doing, in what I like to see as a praxis collecting data, analyzing data, and saying things about that data. This is suffused all the way through with interacting with speakers of the languages I work with, engaging them in my linguistics, and above all, trying to do right by them. Perhaps the defining feature of this praxis of mine is reflexivity. Indeed, I spoke on reflexivity during my job talk when I began here at the University of Bayreuth and have also spent time reflecting on successes as well as failures. For the past year or so, both inside and outside of my professional life, I've also been thinking a lot about rejection. But rest assured to those of you listening, this talk is not going to be about the ruminations of a bitter linguist. As easy as it is, instead of feeling bad about rejection, we're encouraged to think about why it matters. And in this case, I think it matters because it's another opportunity for me to be reflexive. I'm not so foolish as to think that I can do no harm. And I'm not so historically unaware as to think that linguistics and linguistic analysis cannot inflict epistemic violence and real violence on the peoples whose languages are being analyzed. This is therefore a good opportunity to visit both of these questions and see what we find. A final consideration is whether any of this is worth sharing with all of you. I obviously think so, and for two main reasons. The first being that going through this process in the presence of you, an audience of respected peers, is a way of keeping myself open to comment and to suggestions, as well as extending opportunities for learning to others who might find this process useful. Additionally, because this article was rejected without my getting a chance to engage with the anonymous reviewer, I never really had a chance to articulate a response. So whether that anonymous reviewer will ever encounter this talk, I want to use this as my opportunity to exercise that right to respond. It is at this point that I would like to engage with the substance of the reviewer's comments. These were briefly mentioned above, but I will treat each of them in detail in this subsection. 
The first has to do with non-standard glossing. The second two have to do with the existence of underlying morphemes and will be dealt with separately. The first addressing apocope and the second addressing tonal culminativity. Finally, I will talk about zero morphemes in Gorwa. First, however, it is useful for us to address the basic question of what is glossing. Interlinear morpheme-by-morpheme morpheme glosses give information about the meanings and grammatical properties of individual words and parts of words. So here we have the interlinearization of the English phrase, the boy hits the hyenas, which itself is formed of seven individual morphemes, five of which can stand on their own, and two of which must occur with another morpheme, that is, two affixes. In the third line, we provide a gloss, where each of the morphemes is provided with a meaning, often abbreviated as done above. So the is a definite article, and that's abbreviated as def, for example. The first claim of exoticization from the anonymous reviewer has to do with the way in which I've segmented my words into morphemes. The specific comment is, why are non-segmental morphemes slash morphological processes written between tildes and not as per the Leipzig glossing rules? As you can see in the example given below, in some places I segment morphemes by putting them between tildes, these wavy lines highlighted here in red. Within my glossing, this means that an operation is not segmental but suprasegmental. The anonymous reviewer is correct in that this is not a standard way to do this, and typically a phrase like this would be segmented by backslashes, as shown here. Note, however, that by following the Leipzig glossing rules here ends up in an incomplete representation of what is going on. Note that in the standard representation, only two morphemes are segmented and not the four morphemes segmented as I have done above. I would argue that in this regard, the Leipzig glossing rules fall short in providing a sufficiently explicit representation of what is going on in the phrase. In fact, the Leipzig glossing rules recognize this, explicitly stating that most authors will feel the need to add or modify certain conventions. It seems, therefore, that the core issue here is not that I modify the Leipzig glossing rules, but that I employ tildes rather than the backslashes. This, of course, could be easily reconciled simply by replacing the tildes for the backslashes, but representing all of the morphemes as I had intended, resulting in something like this, with backslashes instead of the offending tildes. The question is, therefore, is using a tilde rather than a backslash exoticizing the language? I'd like to argue that this is not the case. The software program that I use to do most of my parsing and glossing, Flex, has an operationalized system of notation to conduct morphological segmentation. One selects words and then uses a set of symbols to segment them accurately. These symbols are set by the software and cannot be changed. And the one way to represent a supersegmental operation, like the ones I showed above for Gorwa, is by placing these supersegmental morphemes between tildes. Returning to the question then, am I exoticizing Gorwa by doing this? To this I would say no. Regarding the tilde itself, it's the operationalized symbol in the software I use to analyze Gorwa to mark supersegmental operations. Regarding the full representation of supersegmental operations in the segmentation, the convention in the Leipzig glossing rules under-represents supersegmental operations, and I've modified the system to better suit the language with which I work. The next two comments from the anonymous reviewer have to do with underlying morphemes. He or she comments that the underlying morphological analysis, the second line, is so far removed from the surface form, the first line, that a reader can hardly connect the two. This difference between the first and second line of examples is due to two phenomena, 
The first is apocope, and the second is tonal culminativity. Apocope is an operation by which words may lose their final sounds or their final morphemes in certain environments. Take, for example, the Gorwa phrase, Kawiana kot, the lake moved. Here, we see that in the second line of the gloss, I've segmented a final a morpheme on the verb, but that this final a is not pronounced. This is one of the ways the second line of the example is different from its surface realization represented in the first line of the example. The final a morpheme is not always unrealized, however. Take, for example, this case, fuunai i sha, I like meat. When segmented and glossed, our example looks like this, again with an a morpheme in the segmentation, but not realized in the surface form. Compare this now to a similar example, this time where the verb is negated. I don't like. Here, not only is the a morpheme segmented, but it is also pronounced in the surface form. The rule that defines the apocope operation in Gorwa is that when the final vowel of the verb occurs at the right edge of the verb word, it undergoes apocope and is not pronounced. When the final vowel of the verb does not occur at the right edge of the verb word, it does not undergo apocope and is pronounced. This applies consistently across all verbs of the language. This allows us to formulate a question. Is including morphemes which disappear due to apocope in Gorwa exoticizing the language? Consider this pair of examples from French published in Glossa. The key distinction with the, which the author wishes to show here is that the form of the verb with the a ending is grammatical, but the form of the verb without the a ending is ungrammatical. Note, however, that in both of these examples, the verbs are pronounced aller exactly the same way. That is, the only way we know that the a suffix is present in 2a above is that it is written that way. As the anonymous reviewer has asked for Gorwa, one could, without knowing any better, equally ask for French, why is the verb in 2a written with an a suffix when it is not pronounced that way? I use this French example to make two points. Not only is phrase final apocope a common morphophonological operation in many languages of the world, including French and Gorwa, but also because we use a phonetic orthography for Gorwa, that is representing how a word is pronounced today, rather than a historical or etymological orthography, that is representing how a word was pronounced in the past, there will be more of a mismatch between the morphological analysis and the surface form. Is this exoticization? To this I answer only if French is considered an exotic language. A second phenomenon in Gorwa which contributes to a seeming mismatch between the surface realization and underlying representation is tonal culminativity. Essentially, this means that even if Gorwa words can be morphologically marked for tone more than once, they can only manifest one tone per word. Consider the following example. Hawata garmanguna ta, the man hit the boy. When segmented and glossed, it looks like this. Immediately, we can see that the verb is formed of four morphemes. The first is the verb stem, which inherently has a high tone. The second is a morphophonological operation, which I represent abstractly as dollar sign B. One of the effects of this morphophonological operation is to lower the tone of the form it attaches to. The next morpheme marks past tense and is realized solely by a high tone, and following this is the final vowel which has no effect on tone. The anonymous reviewer seems to find this rather too complex and notes that a reader is left to wonder whether one could not have simply said that the third person masculine gender past is expressed by the unmarked form of the verb. So according to the anonymous reviewer, instead of this representation, we might instead propose this representation. This is, in fact, perfectly fine, but only for this verb. Once we broaden our examination to include the verbs to get and to agree, and in many others, we can see that not only tonally do we not get the proposed correspondence, but also segmentally the forms do not match up either. 
We could, of course, propose different inflectional patterns for different classes of verbs, but it doesn't allow us to escape from the fact that Gorwa morphology is complex. The question begged by the anonymous reviewer's comment is therefore, is including successive morphemes which may obscure each other in surface realization exoticization? To which I would once again answer no. Firstly, because in Gorwa only one tone can be manifest in a word, even if more than one is marked on the word, that is tonal culminativity. This is consistently the tonal value of the final morpheme. And secondly, because proposing otherwise is not descriptive and actually results in an analysis which cannot account for all of the data. The final comment from the anonymous reviewer which I will address today has to do with zero morphemes. The specific comment reads, the Gorwa glosses are full of zero morphemes. The auxiliary is always realized as zero. To contextualize this observation, in the manuscript I submitted there were 60 examples containing 185 words and 487 morphemes. Of those 487 morphemes, 67, so approximately 7% of the total, were zeros. Of these zeros, the most common was the auxiliary, which the reviewer notes is always realized as zero. We will see below that this comment is inaccurate as we learn more about the auxiliary in Gorwa. Consider once again the example, the man hit the boy. The auxiliary, here realized as zero, is surrounded by a large collection of clitics, forming a special phrasal element which in the southern Cushitic literature is either called the preverbal clitic complex or, more opaquely, the selector. All of these examples feature a selector, indeed, as does every finite phrase in Gorwa. In the simplest sense, as Martin Mouse puts it, the selector, here highlighted in red, is an additional inflectional element that is separate from the verb. Selectors always occur to the left of the lexical verb, here highlighted in green, but not always immediately to the left, as in the highlighted example here. Sometimes other material, like nouns and adverbs, can intervene. Selectors aren't unique to Gorwa, or even to South Cushitic. In Somali, similar structures are called indicator particles. In Oromo, they're called focus markers. Selectors do, however, reach their most morphologically complex forms in Gorwa and the other South Cushitic languages, where they can mark clause type, voice, ventivity, argument structure, aspect, as well as mood. Take this form for example. The form maska in baha maska ta, why was the hyena hit, simultaneously marks a question, a reason, medio passive voice, a third person agent, a feminine gender patient, and perfective aspect. Returning now to our first example, we see that at the heart of each of these inflectional elements, I propose an auxiliary, which in this case is realized as zero. After all, a clitic cannot cliticize to another clitic and uh, be considered a fully fledged uh, independent word. It needs to cliticize to something. Crucially, and contrary to the anonymous reviewer's observation, these auxiliaries are not always realized as zero. In fact, when the auxiliary occurs without overt argument marking, it is realized as a. Consider the following two examples. The form garma ina mama, the boy was ill, and ani ana mama, I was ill. Uh, in the first example, the third person subject is realized as e. Resultantly, the auxiliary is realized as zero. In the second form, however, the first person subject is phonologically null, and the auxiliary is realized as a. Ah. Perhaps a better demonstration of this pattern can be seen in this group of examples. Once again, for the locational copula construction where the subject is marked, the auxiliary is realized as zero. The same is true for the adjectival copula where the entity being modified is marked as both agent and patient along with medio-passive morphology, and the auxiliary is once again realized as zero.
For the final example, the argument is not marked and the auxiliary emerges as a. Ah. This division between forms, the first two being predicational copulae and the last being a specificational copula, where the first two mark arguments and the last does not, is well documented. Returning then to the anonymous reviewer's comment, not only can we see that this is somewhat inaccurate, but it raises the question, is including a commonly occurring part of speech with it, which is sometimes zero in well-defined environments exoticization? To this I would say that I am sympathetic to the underlying premise here. Not only is it descriptively unnecessary to propose a zero morpheme in a language, but when a zero morpheme is proposed in a language, what does that really mean? For example, what does it mean to propose a zero copula in African American vernacular English? If a copula never occurs here, why not just say that there is no copula? This kind of representation is, of course, set in direct relation to standard English, which does employ a copula here, and in this way the African American vernacular is being described in terms of the standard rather than on its own terms. In the worst case, this could be construed to mean that the African American vernacular English is somehow missing something, or somehow deficient. I would like to think that my positing of a zero morpheme in Gorwa is somewhat more carefully considered, ad adhering to the following two restrictions. Firstly, a zero morpheme should exist as an allomorph to a non-zero form. That is, it shouldn't be zero everywhere. This was shown in that the auxiliary is a ah when there is no overt argument marking. Secondly, a zero morpheme should have semantic content. This is also the case for the zero auxiliary in Gorwa. The auxiliary and all morphology which attaches to it only occurs in the finite verb phrases. That is, it is consistently absent in imperative constructions. The auxiliary is therefore a marker of finiteness. To conclude then, the Gorwa zero auxiliary is an alternate form of a, and the morpheme carries the semantic meaning of finiteness. And then also, positing the a ah zero auxiliary is simpler. That is, we're proposing one auxiliary plus its meaningful morphemes that attach to it, and uh, as well as morphophonological operations, versus positing over 50 selectors. By way of summary, then, I would like to talk briefly on exoticization as well as hold this in contrast to the concept of letting Gorwa tell its own story. I should begin by saying that even though the anonymous reviewer commented that I was exoticizing Gorwa, I really have no idea how he or she understands the term. I will be explicit here in that I understand exoticization as the rendering of something, or more often someone, as different, often for the purposes of entertainment or profiteering. At its core, this is a process of othering, ultimately making a person or a group of people to be seen as somehow less human. As a linguist working in an African context, I think of the painful examples of Sarah Bartman dubbed the so-called Hottentot Venus, or the Mbuti teenager Ota Benga, who was kept in a cage with apes at the Bronx Zoo. I also think of the direct and enduring epistemic violence visited on huge swathes of the African continent by the Hamitic hypothesis, which itself was highly buttressed by linguistic analyses, such as the construal of noun class systems employed by speakers of languages, including those of the Bantu language family, as less developed than gender systems spoken by the so-called Hamitic race. This is a direct and altogether not too distant example of exoticization and its aftermath. Returning now to the comments of the anonymous reviewer, I hope that by taking some time to explore the reasoning behind my choices above, I've clarified that my intent was not to render Gorwa different, certainly either for the purposes of entertainment or for personal profit. Instead, I see my glossing practices, as well as my entire practice as a linguist, as letting Gorwa tell its own story. The phenomena I wrote about in the larger manuscript derived from patterns I observed in natural Gorwa speech, 
which I've been observing for over a decade. Much previous work on Southern Cushitic is based heavily on elicited examples and narrative speech. I believe that by working with and taking seriously the natural speech data, a fresh view of Gorwa and indeed Southern Cushitic can be achieved. The reviewer's observations and questions are valid and represent his or her philosophy of, past experience with, and preferences in the practice of segmenting and glossing li linguistic examples. But by framing these observations as me attempting to exoticize Gorwa, the reviewer breaks the first rule of review writing and, and assumes that I somehow had ill intent. Though this part of the review was useful as a provocation, I think that ultimately this aspect of it was poorly considered and comes across as cynical and rather mean-spirited. I would like to conclude by thinking about future directions, and for this I like to refer to this diagram which I adapted from Wesley Leonard. Here we see linguistics, which I take to include most of the things I've discussed today, as only one subfield of a much more broad and inclusive enterprise, which Leonard refers to as language work. I find it comforting that in this vision of language work, there are other ways for me to allow Gorwa to tell its own story, through working deeply with Gorwa narratives, through continuing community documentation work, through lexicography, grammar writing, and all the other ways of honoring the language and the people who speak it. Misguided accusations aside, the reviewer was right in pointing out tons of things in the manuscript that, are, that were insufficiently explained or unexplained, and for which there is no recourse to a published description, simply because no sufficient published description of Gorwa exists. So for any linguist hoping to write formally or theoretically about a language, this does demonstrate that a greater burden of proof is put upon someone working on, say, Gorwa than it does for someone working on, say, French. This is at once quite unfair, but also a reminder that such fundamental work is nevertheless required if Gorwa is to be brought to bear on larger conversations in the field. Thank you, and these are my references.